Welcome to Big Blue Kickoff Live. This is Thursday's edition here on Giants.com, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football Giants. I'm Paul Dottino. He's two-time Super Bowl champ Jonathan Casillas. So glad you could join us again today because, man, we're going to make this a caller-centered phone call. Uh, Caller-centered a show, there not you go. phone call, show. <laughs> I know um, what you meant. I'm so excited about today that I'm stumbling over my words. <laughs> uh, here's the reason, folks, because as you probably are aware, over the last 48 hours, a lot of stuff has been coming out of this building, whether it's the 100th uh, season celebration, which is going to begin this September, or the fact that the commemorative uniforms uh, have now been released to the public, and you guys now see that. Or the schedule, which is now out, and I don't think you guys have really had an opportunity to talk about that either. So we got a whole litany, a palette, if you will, of big blotches of paint. You can go anywhere you like. <laughs> you can go to the red, the blue, the green, the orange, whatever you got. Blotches of paint all over the palette. And we invite you to call us at 201-939-4513. I want to go rapid fire, and I want to make this your chance to react to the news of the last 48 hours because so much has happened in the world of the New York football giants. Our number is 201-939-4513, 201-939-4513. Now, Let's talk for a moment, Jonathan, before we get to our calls. And the lines are open, so please dial us up. We'll get to you as soon as we possibly can because, again, I want to make this, this show about you guys. Um, the uniforms. This is a tribute to the heritage and the history and the tradition of the New York football giants. For those of you who've had a quick glance at the uniforms, that you can find on the Giants website at Giants.com and all of their social media platforms. One of the panels has a complete explanation for what the uniform actually stands for. The other ones don't. So I, I want to draw your attention to this one particular one because it talks about the 1933 jersey that they're using, which is basically red with a big blue stripe across the chest, which has the number on it, and then uh, thinner white stripes sandwiching the blue stripe horizontally across the chest. That's from the 1933 New York football giants. The helmet, which looks very similar to the Wolverine helmet mm -hmm. from the University of Michigan, yep. that's the 1938 helmet. It's blue with the red uh, Wolverine-type claw yeah. on the front of it. The pants and the socks, which are a light tan with primarily red socks, but again in the design with the stripes of the shirt or the jersey, they come from the 1925 Giants. Now, the significance, of course, there is 1925 was the first year yep. of the New York football Giants. So this is what the Giants have done. They are paying tribute and homage to their history and basically their first decade of football. Now, to those of you who don't understand a lot of the uniform history with this team, uh, and Jonathan, this, this probably will be news to you because I don't think players pay much attention to this stuff. A couple of items. First of all, the Giants did have primarily red in their uniforms until the early 50s, early to mid 50s. It was only then that they decided to minimize the red and truly become big blue. Mm -hmm. I don't know the reason for it. I never actually asked Wellington Mara uh, while he was still with us why that happened. I always grew up with the Giants being big blue. And to be frank with you, until I started to study the history of the team, didn't know that red was a big deal for them. Yeah. So that's number one, okay? Red was a primary color for this team, again, till the early to mid-50s. In 1957, the National Football League put in a rule. We're going to have home jerseys and we're going to have road jerseys. Up until that time, you could have two, three, four different jerseys and you just change them and put on whatever you wanted to that week. 
But in 57, they said, no, 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 no. You're going to have your primary white jersey as your road. You're going to have your primary color jersey, your home. And that's the way it stood for decades and decades on end until some years ago, the NFL started to experiment with the alternates and the throwbacks. And, and if you recall for a while there, right, the Giants were wearing all red tops for a few years. Yep. That was... Was that a standard home jersey for the Giants? The well, red? at one point it was. It was? At one point it was. Oh, yeah. And now, my question, because you said in 1957, the rules changed basically saying you got to have a darker color home jersey. You right? have to have a colored home jersey. A colored a home, colored jersey, home jersey, jersey. And then a white And a white jersey. road jersey. So when did it change? Because I know Miami... They go white. Right. I know Dallas goes white at home. When did that change? Or was that just saying you got to have a designated home jersey? Right. Well, specifically with Dallas and with uh, Miami, part of the reason was because they played in the South where it was really hot. Yeah, it makes sense they, why they do it. They yeah. asked, can we have our designated jersey the opposite way? Right. And that's why that happened. Right. Dallas yeah. became home but it's, it's Miami was home whites. But if you think about it, though, it, it puts them in, a, in an interesting category because most teams have darker color jerseys at home, yeah. which forces the away team to wear white jerseys. Mm -hmm. So Dallas and Miami not only are wearing white jerseys at home, but because everybody else has darker colors at their home, they're wearing white all year long. You know what I mean? Well, Parcells, when he became head coach of the Giants for the first several years, he believed that the dark Cowboys jersey was a jinx on them because for quite a while... The navy they blue one, right? Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. They didn't have a great record with that blue jersey. So Parcells would tell the Giants, we're wearing our, our whites at to get, Giant Stadium to, get Dallas to, to wear force blue. Dallas to wear their blues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, Bill was very superstitious. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of coaches are like that, too. Ultra superstitious. Yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like that. I'm not superstitious, but there is something into when the Giants are wearing these throwbacks and if the Giants win. Because for me, I'm I'm in I'm indecisive about how I feel about them, and I'm not I don't love them. You know, I think they can look good, but I tell you what, the Giants they look great when you win. That's what I was. <laughs> that was the point I was gonna make. If they win, especially if it's a good win against a good team, quality win, I'm pretty sure these jerseys are gonna be worn at home. So it's gonna be a good team that they're hosting. They'll wear them up. They can wear them up to twice. By the way, they, have they? Told us what they have not designated, yet. as I understand it. I don't believe that was designated. So yet. definitely not going to be week one for sure, right? They're not going to be week one. I don't know that. But no, no, no teams go throwback week one, right, Pearson? No team goes throwback week one. You know I what? Don't I don't want to misspeak here, yeah. so I'm going to go right to the <clears throat> Giants website right now. I believe, I know that they did identify that they can wear them up to twice during the course of the season. Yeah, I think that's all it is. They but haven't designated the any dates games have yet. not been designated. And the second game is definitely predicated on the win or loss of the first game. I mean, that's just my gut, my guess. Okay. Because if they lose wearing these jerseys, and if they lose handily, these jerseys are going in the trash. <laughs> They're not breaking them back out, dog. <laughs> They're not doing it, man. They're not doing um, it. And you know, Dayball is like that, though. Dayball is like that. <laughs> Dayball, he has these things of he does certain things. I think he was eating uh, lunch on Fridays or something like that. And then I went in to eat with him. And then we won. And he was like, JC, you know you got to come eat with me again. He does, like He's like uh, that. So I'm, have that. I'm 100% yes, sure whenever the Giants do decide to wear these throwbacks, however we feel about them, right? I'm indecisive about them. If they win, they'll wear them the second time. If they lose, throw them in the trash. They might not ever see them again. I'm just saying. You know, I, I will say this. Uh, I get a bad feeling every time I see people wearing the throwback logo from the 1975 season. Now, to explain, 1975 is the one year that the Giants shared Shea Stadium with the Jets. They had played uh, in the Yell Bowl, okay, uh, after their second home game of the 73 season at Yankee Stadium, Yankee Stadium was going to be renovated. They kicked the Giants out of Yankee Stadium. The Yankees went to the Yale Bowl, and they played the rest of the 73 home games at the Yale Bowl in Connecticut and in 74 at the Yale Bowl in Connecticut. Though that's, the, that's the darkest age of Giants football. So in 75, they come back to New York, but Giants Stadium isn't ready yet in the Meadowlands. So they go to the city of New York, and they're like, well, where are we going to go? Oh, okay, you're going to play at Shea Stadium where the Jets play. 
So for one year. So, wait, 19... so the Jets were already playing at Shea Stadium? The Jets have been the playing at Shea Stadium the whole time. Uh, that was their home. I didn't know that. That was their home. Okay. And so in 75, the Giants became a tenant of Shea. And in that year, they wore what is now, and I can't show you. I'm sure you've seen it, though. It was called the Disco NY. It was the N. It was the uh, the N with the Y, and it was like a double or triple. It was a double um, a double N Y. Go take a look. 1975 Giants logo. It was a double N Y. I call. I they they. It became known as the Disco Giants logo. Well, the reason that 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 I don't like seeing that when I see throwbacks and people have that on. Is because that was a horrific season. This one? That's the one. The okay. Double NY. I've seen it before. I think I have a hat like that, actually. I'm too. sure you do. Because during this era of throwbacks, that's one of the... It's like a, re- like a retro... Right. Yeah. That, that's been one of the, the logos that has popped up as part of the throwbacks. I get... I just get... My stomach turns. You don't like it. Well, they were 5-9 and nine that season, and that was a really bad football team. Okay. Craig Morton was the starting quarterback. Walker Gillette was our best wide receiver. Okay? Joe Dawkins was our leading running back. That was the final season of Spider Lockhart. I mean, it was was not. The jerseys don't look bad. It was uh, not. I see the logo could could throw you off a little bit. The jerseys look like kind of the throwbacks. Yeah, but see. These are the throwbacks that the Giants wear now, the color rush. Okay, but the problem was. It was the ugly football that was even worse. Oh, yeah. That that make everything look ugly. Okay. That make everything look ugly. So, and and believe me, Shea Stadium, it was real grass. So that field, that year. It was all chopped up, wasn't it? The Mets and Yankees both played there for baseball. So up until the end of September. And the Jets and Giants both played there for football. That field it was, was an up. absolute disaster. Yeah. It was all dirt. Horrible. Yeah. Dirt. Mud, frozen mud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Horrible. Yeah. And the quality of the, of the games was impacted also by the field. It was just dreadful. <laughs> yeah. Dreadful. We we had uh, my high school uh, football stadium, Memorial Stadium, over in uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey. We had a grass field. Now it's turf now. But back then, we had the grass field, and you got varsity football playing. Mm-hmm. You got JV. You got freshman football playing. You also have soccer, varsity, and J junior varsity, mm-hmm. and you have all of Pop Warner playing on the same field. So by October, October, the second month of the season, the field is like it's like it starts like with little brown spots. Yeah, you know, always then, always starts that. And way. then mid October, November, half the field is completely brown. Yeah, and it's terrible. It's really bad. But we looked fast, and we won a lot of games in that field. <laughs> hey, winning is always the band-aid, yeah, right? For sure. Always. But that's why for these jerseys, I'm indifferent. If the Giants win with these jerseys on, I'm sure I'm going to feel a lot better about them. But okay. if they lose. All right. Final <laughs> thought, and I'm going to get Jonathan's response here, and then we're going to go to your phones uh, or your calls. The lines are open. 201-939-4513. Please, we're looking for your reaction to the uniforms. We're looking for your reaction to the schedule. Okay? And, oh, by the way, our own Pearson over there, opposite the camera, our, our very crack producer who just does, does a kick-butt job every single day, uh, he is the, uh, the very studious gentleman <laughs> in our schedule reveal that came out this past week. So, please... Don't be afraid to go to YouTube and leave your comments about the uh, erstwhile Pearson Butler who uh, donned the microphone for this very special assignment. Uh, his interview with the pigeon was imp- was particularly I, I, impressive. I, I, the first thing I said when I when I came in, I was like, hey, man, I just watched you on, uh, on Instagram. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't know your hair was that big because he always has a hat on. He does. Every time I come in here, he always has a hat on. Only time I seen him with it off is when he takes it off real quick, slicks it back, and he got the mat, the helmet here, so it's okay. like flat. Okay. I didn't know his hair was so big. It was, <laughs> so, it was humid that day. Right? It, it, humid. it just expands. <laughs> so go to the Giants YouTube page, please. Click on on Pearson's video, and uh, by all means, if you want to see more Pearson, please let us know. I'm down There's for plenty it. of room there for the comments. Yeah. 
you know, we're, we're good with that. Pierce uh, is the man, too. Let me, let me let you know. He's the man. He don't say too much. He chimes in every now and again. But he does a good job here making sure we, we look productive. like we know what we're doing, but it's he's the guy that the man is makes everything go. Productive. So, shout I think, out to Pearson. I can't even tell you how many times he will throw a life preserver to save somebody. Oh, yeah, for sure. That, that's what that He's the human life preserver, Pearson <laughs> Butler. Of course, he's also a Bruins and Celtics fan, but we don't really want to talk about that. Eastern Conference Finals, let's go. (laughs) Well, and go New York, go New York, go. We're going to kick your butt twice. Tomorrow. In the NBA and the NHL. Tomorrow, right? All right, before we go to the calls, again, there's a line open, 201-939-4513. Giants open the 2024 season at home against the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, Folks, I actually remember the last time that happened back in 1969 at Yankee Stadium when Fran Tarkenton threw a couple of late touchdown passes to Don Herman and the Giants actually beat Minnesota uh, here in New York. Uh, This will be the first time they've had a a season opener against the Vikings since 69. So uh, it's it's a rare oddity. My only question to you as we uh, get ready for the phone calls, did it ever matter to you whether or not you opened with a divisional opponent or a rival, or was it totally indifferent? Did you not care? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really care. Even though those uh, in division games, they 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 almost count as double because you know you win one in division sure. and you give a team in your division a loss. It didn't matter, man. I, I, like you, as soon as the schedule got released. You know, and we're we're doing it too. We're going to focus on Minnesota for you know for the next few months because that's the opening game. Just like the players, the players are focusing on Minnesota. Of course, they're you know they're they're looking ahead to the division. Of course, but you got to be ready for that first game, week one, whoever that opponent is. And now that you have the opponent, now you prepare your off season to open up against the Minnesota Vikings. JJ McCarthy led Minnesota Vikings, which is going to be interesting. Sam Donald might have something to say about that. I agree, but... Uh, what Opening r- day? W- what pick was he? It doesn't matter. It does. If he's you not so? ready, if he's I, not ready. That's what truly matters. That's what truly matters. But, I mean, from the things I've heard, and that, and that was somebody that the Giants... There was a little rumors about the Giants possibly doing something draft day, right, to move up to get this kid, right? Yeah, but that didn't happen. Right, it didn't because happen. Because, obviously, they were not that interested in him. Right, right. Maybe they just threw it out there just to <laughs> just to get screens, the buzz, right? right? Just to get the buzz going. Look, they but, got weapons, though, on that team. Yes, that's what, what I was— What they don't have right now is a pass rush. That's what I was I was going to lead to. The, the guy on the outside— I think you can call him either 1A or 1B as a top receiver in the league Mm -hmm. in Justin Jefferson. He reminds me of a a young OBJ when I got to New York. And I would go to other teams that we played, like Tampa. I don't know if I told you about this story. The year after I got here to New York, uh, we play in Tampa. So I'm in New York. We're playing in Tampa. I'm in the end zone stretching. And I was just in Tampa the year prior with you know the Tempe Buccaneers so I see some of the defensive backs they they see me in the end zone they come over Jay-Z what's up you know we just shooting the stuff right and I was like hey man I just want to let y'all know man like I hope y'all got a game plan for number 13 because that dude is different (laughs) and I used to tell people like yo like just letting y'all know he's a different type of cat over there that's what Justin Jefferson is he's that he's a different type of cat Neighbors kind of fits that category, too. I mean, he has to prove it. He, he has does. to prove it. He does. Justin Jefferson came in this league as a lot of these LSU young receivers come in, and they just literally take the league by storm. And yeah. Odell did it. Uh, uh, Odell's running mate did it. What's his name? Um, the kid that played in Cleveland for a while. Landry. Uh, Landry, Landry did it. Jarvis Landry. Justin Jefferson did it. Mm-hmm. I mean, Ruben Randall. Chase. Right, Jamar Chase did it. Ruben Randall, back in the day, he kind of did it Randall too had early one on. one really good year. Yep. He had over 800 yards one season. You know, so some about these LSU receivers, you know, yeah, these well, young receivers. Like and Penn State linebackers. <laughs> yeah, they come into the league ready to go. They're ready. They're, they're route ready. They're savvy. They have the catch radius, the catch ability to go mm-hmm. get it. They spectacular catch, the moves after catch. And neighbors fits in that category, so it'll be a good – you know, to see who's the better LSU receiver week one, the guy that's been doing it for a few years and the new guy that would just pick that number six. I'll put my money on the Giants' pass rush over what Minnesota has now because their top two pass rushers from last year are gone. Yep. 
that's a big deal. Absolutely. Especially in this day and age when it comes to applying pressure to the quarterback. All right, so we have talked about the Century Red uniforms, which is the official name of this hybrid throwback. I like the name, though. I like the name. That's the name. So we've talked about that. We talked about opening day against the Vikings. We'll get more into the schedule a little bit later on, but I see the the calls are lighting up, so we're going to go to the phone lines at 201-939-4513 and get your reaction. We're going to start with um, Alex in Tampa. You're first on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hey, Paul. Hey, Jonathan. Uh, thanks for taking my call today. Sure. What's going on, Alex? Hey, so um, a couple quick points real quick and a couple predictions. First, I like the helmets. They remind me of uh, Michigan, uh, except with red and blue instead of red and yellow. Mm-hmm. Not so hot on red is the dominant color, but red is my favorite color, so uh, I guess I'm <laughs> – a little indifferent on that, like Jonathan. Um, <laughs> second, second, we uh, two years ago we handled uh, uh, Jefferson in the playoffs with our defense, so I'm not uh, too concerned on him, and I'm looking forward to see how Neighbors competes with uh, Jefferson in, a, in the first week of the season. I also hope we play their they play their rookie quarterback. That would be nice. I, I somewhat doubt that they're going to put him in on the first game of the season. I think he's more of a project. But my main point is uh, I'm really looking forward to really watching the offensive and defensive lines this year. I want to see if our defense can stop the run, which we struggled at last year. And then the offense, you know, not only just improving, but uh, I'm a little concerned we we don't really have a good solution or a backup for left tackle. I think we've got some depth at guard and, and right tackle, but should something happen, um, I think we could uh, we could suffer some of the same challenges we had last year. Um, I'd love your thoughts when I get off. Predictions for this year? I think we will uh, sweep the Redskins again. I think we'll be four and six in the division. We will we will win uh, a game for the first time in many years against the Cowboys. And I'm going to predict it's Thanksgiving Day. We'll lose at home, but we'll win in Dallas mm. on Thanksgiving Day. And uh, really enjoy. Uh, the all the uh, the content you guys have had of late. I know it's kind of the slow part, but uh, go Big Blue. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for the call. He meant four, four and two in a division. Yeah, and I think yeah. uh, he also meant the Commanders. Yeah. <laughs> but I get it. Trust me. John likes to remind me all the time. You can't call them the other name anymore. I'm like, well, but when you refer to the, the old, old team, team you, you have to. You have to because you're talking about. That was their name. Yeah, when I played. The Commanders, they were the Redskins. Right. So when I refer to Sonny my Jorgensen playing days. played for the Redskins. When I talk about my John playing Riggins days. John Riggins played for the Redskins. I talk about the Redskins because that's the Washington I know. team that I played I for. I still call them the football team. The fo- <laughs> that was like, what, two years they had that name WFT. Three years? three years, I think. Three years? It? Man. That was interesting. Anyway, all right. Um, let's address the uh, left tackle spot. Going into the draft, um, I had thought that if they didn't take a flyer, on a tackle project late that they would potentially bring in, if they could, another veteran. Because right now, Matt Nelson, the former Detroit Lion, would be the next man up at, uh, at tackle, at the swing spot. Now, this, of course, assumes that you're going to use Elmanor at guard because Neil and Thomas are going to be your starting tackles. Right. Right. That's the best case scenario for the Giants is yeah. that Illuminor becomes a guard. He becomes the right guard and Neil's your right tackle and Thomas is your left tackle. If that's the case, right now, Matt Nelson, the former Lion, is your swing tackle. Right or left. You're talking about He's right. He's your swing. Yeah, you're talking about Either right way. or left tackle. Either way. First the, guy in the game, right or left tackle. Now, now John said to me, well, <clears throat> Illuminor would probably move out. If one of the tackles got hurt, Illuminor would probably move out the tackle and then you'd have, I said, but John, here's the one problem with that. And I understand it. The problem is now you've got to sub out two, two spots instead of only one. Right. Yeah. And sometimes coaches are very reluctant to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you think right now Illuminor is going to be the right guard as That's of right now? That's what I think. Yeah. That's interesting. I think the competition for O line will be at that right tackle position between Illuminor mm-hmm. and Evan Neal. Mm hmm. And I'm looking at this roster. I don't know. And nothing's set in stone, right? There's no, of course not. There's no official rosters, of course not. right? 
or project it because that's the only you do project right mm-hmm. there's no projected rosters i think the battle will come at right, t- right tackle mm-hmm. because i think we understand who we have at left tackle i think we understand who we have at center the guards for me i would i would put them i want to say secondary but i think you have to solidify the right tackle position and if that's going to be an improved Evan Neal, I think that's what everybody would be happy about. Sure. Evan Neal would be happy about it. I know the coaches will be happy about that. The fans will be happy about if Evan Neal can increase his play, play a lot better than he's shown the last two years, and actually you know, solidify that right tackle position and give, I think, a Luminor bump him inside to play that right guard position. And I think if it works the opposite way, if a Luminar beats Evan Neal out for the right tackle position, I don't see Evan Neal being a backup. I see them trying him at a, a, a guard spot. Okay. That's what I see happening. Run you to be the left guard, right? Right. That's what that? I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> you know, in terms of who may get picked up between now and opening day, I'm still thinking that there may be somebody out there, some veteran out there who might get set free who they might want to consider bringing in to at least compete with Matt Nelson as a potential option so that you could avoid making two moves if your tackle goes down. Yeah. <clears throat> Make sense? Yeah, because you had to bump a guy over then move a guy, uh, elevate right. a guy. Yeah. I, I always believe if at all possible, and sometimes it's not possible, try to minimize the number of moves you have to make due to an injury. Understood, yep. Understood. So, yeah, but I mean, it, it all Matt, depends. Matt Nelson, to me, doesn't deserve to just have that spot by himself. He should have to compete for it. Yes, 100%. I, th- I think besides the left tackle spot, all these jobs should be competitive jobs, mm-hmm. you know, because I think the only person that has proved that he's a stalwart right now on this entire roster, let's go offense. I'm not going to go defense because I think it's not the same thing on defense. On offense, I think the only person that has solidified himself as a guy that can make it to the Pro Bowl if he has a healthy year, Mm -hmm. I think is Andrew Thomas, Mm -hmm. right? So those guys, not to say that they're not competing because they are, but it's a little bit different when you show up in training camp knowing that your job is your job. Yes. It's a huge difference. Absolutely And if you can go probably man for man, man for man, nobody has that security as an Andrew Thomas, which I believe is good. Because now in training camp, it's like, I got to perform at a very high level to make sure I solidify the job that I think is mine. Because Andrew Thomas, I think the only one that knows that is his job. Everybody mm-hmm. else is like, I believe this is my job, but I have to go out and secure it. Not to say Andrew Thomas is not going to practice hard, but it's a little different mindset. And it's a great mindset to have to keep the competition alive, which I think brings out the best in everybody involved. No question. Back to the lines, uh, 201-939-4513. Rob from Yonkers, uh, you're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. How you guys doing? Good morning or good afternoon. Hi. What's up, Rob? Um, how you doing? All right, so John and Kiss could see us. Um, you had a couple weeks ago, you said something that you will only put two running backs, that you will only pick two running backs in front of Saquon Barkley, but you never got to say who they were. Uh, right now, I mean, I think you got to go probably McCaffrey. Um, okay. to pick another guy over him uh, from what Derrick Henry has done possibly depends on what type of offense you will run um, I would have to go through him again because I said it at the time I probably had the two of mine but I know McCaffrey would probably be number one and then possibly Derrick Henry given the type of offense that I want to run but I mean Saquon's the do everything type of guy like a McCaffrey you know, and he's improved, yeah. I believe, as a pass as a pass pro guy. So that means you can have him in all three downs and don't even wear it. You can give him carries on first and second. You can get him out the backfield on third, and you can also keep him in for protection. And look, I I, I love his game, and I like the way he is off the field. I told Paul about the experience I had with him the first time I ever met him. We were up in uh, um, in Fort Lee doing some play 60 stuff with kids, and I saw his character for the first time before I saw him play a game in the NFL, and I was a believer in him from the beginning. And then I watched him play, and I was like, bro, this is not only a solid dude, I always fought for him as a man, as a human being, yeah. because I know the type of person he is. You know, so yeah. I don't know those other guys, but for me, in terms of talent and stuff like that, there's nobody really better than him besides of McCaffrey, because of Derrick Henry. <clears throat> and these are 
solid guys that's played a good amount of football in this league and that are proven guys that have done it for years and years and years. <clears throat> Saquon has been inconsistent with his injuries, but I still yeah. take him mostly probably over any other running backs besides the two guys I named. And and that might be given what type of offense we run in. Okay. Um, I have one more thing for Paul, and then um, I'm going to talk about the offense, and I'll take it off. Yeah. Paul, um, you, you guys spoke about um, Marvel um, not too long ago as well, and who would, who would um, Thibodeau be? I, I agree with you, Iron Man, because Iron Man is very cocky, and Thibodeau is very cocky. So <laughs> I, I, I definitely agree with Thibodeau, but I got one more guy for you, I'm Donald. Because Thanos was basically the destroyer of worlds, and I feel I feel typical because he's the destroyer of all other teams. Snap his finger. That's what I feel. Well, yeah. you know, the the and, other day, if you caught the show, he apparently told Steve Serby of the New York Post that he's Black Panther. So okay, okay. if that if like that's that. what he's going to call himself, yeah. then I'm going to tip my cap and I, I like will that. call him Black Panther. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I I'll go with that. <laughs> and everything about about the offense, real quick. Um. The offense is only going to do as far as much as the um, as as they protect the quarterback. If no they doubt. Protect Daniel. If they protect Daniel Jones, we're good to go. The only thing, if they if if we keep going three and out, we have a good defense. But if we keep going three and out, you're going to get our defense tired, and then defense is not going to be doing be able to do anything here. And I'll take my questions off the air. Thank you guys so much. Have a good day. Thank you so much, Rob. Appreciate the phone call. Two zero one nine three nine four five one three. Lines are open again. We could talk about the schedule. We could talk about the uh, the jerseys and the uniforms. Uh, one thing I will say, uh, Jonathan, and I don't know if we've actually had this conversation with you before, but we know the Giants have tried to upgrade their offensive line, but at the same time they've also upgraded their pass rush by getting Brian Burns in the trade from the Panthers. As a defensive player, you go into the season and you know the offense has been challenged. How much aware are you of the transactions, of the upgrades they've made. And do you think about that as you go into the season and into training camp saying, hmm, I really want to take a look at what this offense is going to do because we know they need to be better. Does that cogn- Is it cognizant with you? Does it weigh on your mind? Is it something you actively think about as you get ready for camp? You're talking about me? As, yeah, when, as when, when, you when were, I played. When you were a defensive <clears throat> player. Oh, yeah, for sure. A hundred percent, you know, because at the end of the day, like I always felt like, not that it's my team, but it's my team. It's my family. You know what I mean? Like I have, you know, uh, my part I have to do, but I also want to make sure the guys that are doing their parts are are there and we have the right pieces. Not that I could do anything about it, but I definitely was aware of, of who was playing offensive line and, you know, who was I going against, you know? Like, I remember, you know, my first year playing for the New Orleans Saints. I made it my duty to learn every single body on the offensive line. Uh, you, you had Bushra, you had Jari Evans, like, you had uh, a Goody in the middle, you had Stinchcomb, like, I knew everybody, you know, right away. You know, and I don't know if that's, that was just me or what, but I wanted to be very well aware of who I was going against at training camp and mm-hmm, practice mm-hmm. and then who was going to be representing us during the season. And for me, I was always well prepared going against any opponent as well too. So I don't know if that was just me, but I definitely knew, you know, and then and then also like when I got to New York and the Giants brought in Olivier Vernon, they brought in Jack Rabbit on the defensive side. Like I not only knew what position they were playing, I knew how much money they were making. Like, you know what I'm saying? I knew about all of that stuff. I was very in the loop about everything. I made sure I learned about all of that stuff. Okay, so now training camp starts, and we'll talk about this more when we get to July, but let me just run this by you quickly now. So you were curious and you wanted to know about the guys you were going to go up against on the other side of the ball, but you also wanted to know about the guys who were going to be on your side of the ball yeah. too. Going in battle with me. Which mm-hmm. which of those two things were you more curious about? Uh, I think it it depends on the time of the year. You know, as you're approaching this time of the year, we're not really worried about an opponent quite yet. So I'm definitely worried about the roster, who's on the roster. You know, I, like I said, I can't do nothing about it. Right. I never had a say <laughs> on who they're bringing in, but I was definitely curious. I wanted to know everything, you know. So when I did, you know, talk to my dad, who's a huge Giants fan all his life, I talked to my dad, he brings up somebody's name, I got something to tell him about him. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, so it wasn't really like, it, it didn't really matter per se in terms of my ability to perform on the field or my preparation or anything like that. But I, I always wanted to know things like that. I always wanted to know who I was going into battle with, you know, and, and have some type of personal relationship with them, whether it was high and by, or I would sit down and eat with them at lunchtime. 
You know, like that's why you see me now. Like I speak to every single person in this building. You know, yeah. a lot of people in this building know who I am. You know, and it's not just the players. I barely know the players because all the players are new. They change. But the staff, the front desk guys, every single person in that cafeteria, I know all of them by name. Mm -hmm. I know the cleaning people. Like, I know the video guys. Like, I know the mm -hmm. trainers, of course. I know everybody, not everybody, but I know a lot of people in this building, and I've always been like that. I'm a people person, and for me, it's like, if I can help you out in any type of way, boom, and then vice versa. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, well, we're all a team. Right, we're all a team, and it's the whole building. You know, so for me, you know, I took that, very seriously when I played ball from when I was a young kid till I got older. That's something I'm trying to instill in my daughter. You know, she's kind of putting, I got friends on my team and then I got my teammates. And I'm oh. like, and I'm like, I understand, but like they oh. all need to be your sisters. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then and then on top of that, you can't hold on to them forever because they're not gonna be your sisters forever. Like right. you're real, she got two little sisters. But they're they're you know, metaphorically your sisters. They're metaphorically your family. Right. And not to say you have you don't have favorites and stuff like that, but you don't treat them differently. You treat them the same. You treat them with respect. You treat them all the same way because that's what you want to be treated. You know, as a teammate, as a family member on this team that you're playing in. And I always carried that on me. You know, I don't know what it was, but I always carried it on me. I always carried, you know, like. I wouldn't like, you know, offensive line and defensive guys, they don't really hang out much. No. But if I would see an offensive lineman, yo, that's my brother. Mm -hmm. Not that he played linebacker with me, that's my brother. Yeah, yeah. Levante, David, all my linebackers, we we're friends forever. But like a Stinchcomb or a Jari Evans or Bushrod, like those are my brothers too. You know, even they're on the other side of the ball. We maybe not hung out, you know, during the season. Well, but if I see jersey. him out, I'm same embracing jersey. him, giving him a big hug. Yeah, it's the same jersey. We're the same family. You're just not one of my favorite brothers. You know, you're one of my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this, and we'll talk about this topic as we get closer to training camp. I will say this. I would be very surprised if Brian Dable and the defensive staff are not instructing the Giants' defensive front to give this new rebuilt offensive line as much as they can handle oh, during yeah. training camp. You have to, though. Because they need to get those guys ready as quickly as they possibly can and to get them playing up. It's going to be huge. And those defensive players are going to be responsible to help do that. For oh, sure. yeah, There's for no sure. Doubt. Listen, when you when you the, the reason why the NFL is so great because every single person on the roster, on the staff, they deserve to be at, in the NFL. You get prodded and tested since you were a little kid. You know, all throughout high school, then you get to college, and then they test you over and over and over again. And literally, they test you. They take you to combine. They got the new test that they're doing. They had the, you know, the old test that I was doing back in the day. Like, they have so many different things that you can't get to the NFL by mistake. You can't get to the NFL yeah. by mistake. Maybe you, you're not on the level of certain other guys, but everybody's a proven commodity when they get to the NFL. But then there's also levels. Right, I no get doubt. to the NFL. No the doubt. first running back that I had to guard was Reggie Bush, <laughs> <laughs> the first guy. Welcome. And just two years, three years ago, I'm just I got his poster on my wall. Like I'm a big USC fan. He's a Heisman winner. Like Welcome. you know. So for me, I always I always loved going against great competition, not only for myself, but to make sure I got them prepared as well. All right, two zero one nine three nine four five one three. Quickly, we go back to line one. Joseph in the Bronx, you're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Hello, how you guys doing? We're well. How are you? Not bad, not bad. Um, so my my question for you guys are is, you kind of I think you kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, so with the with the rebuild of, I'm, that's what I'm gonna call it is a rebuild of uh, the offense now because we re, re, now rebuilding our offensive line, our running backs. Um, just our offense in general. Um, where do you think we stand to? Because um, I heard you saying something about us thinking about picking up a new veteran or a veteran off off uh, the the free agency block once um, somebody is released. Uh, where do you think we stand in offense, our offensive line um, matching up with? Every other, every other 32, uh, 31 teams in the NFL um, as far as winning games. All right. Well, Joseph, I will say this. What I'm suggesting is that the radar should be active and on for a potential tackle pickup. 
to enhance the competition and depth at the spot. That's my premise. Now, you may or may not agree. I don't know. Jonathan, I think you kind of do. Yeah, why not? I always think, look, I always think the the more talent, the more competition at a position, especially if it comes from some a veteran who has experience in the NFL, I think that's invaluable. And they have a lot of guys, by the way, numbers on the inside. And, and look, a just, lot of numbers. Just look what Pew brought to the team last year. And look, Pew will tell you, Pew was 280 pounds. Mm. He was 20, 30 pounds lighter than he normally played at for that position. But then he came in, as he said, straight off the couch, and he gave a boost. His play wasn't, I think, at, up to par, but his mentality was there, his camaraderie yes. was there, and he brought, he made sure those guys were hanging out. That's what a veteran does. And that's uh, be, it's invaluable to bring in a veteran like that. Will he be back next year? At this point, no. no right. He's a free agent and has not signed anywhere. I know he has said he'd like to come back, but I don't know what the future holds for him. But the intangibles were certainly evident yes. when he came to like the, the team. The play, you know, you, the play was exactly what you would think it would be from a guy that's been sitting on the couch. You know what I mean? Who's a little bit undersized. I tell you what, that game against Buffalo, the primetime game against the Bills, he goes in there and plays the whole game. Yep. Was that his first game? It was yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. It was yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. You got to tip your hat to somebody like that. You know what I mean? You know? Yeah, you do. It was ridiculous. Say so He started and played the whole game after the previous game he had gotten in some, but he was gassed. He, and he, he, he knew. He showed us a lot, a lot, not just on the field, but how you handle the media. Which is we had a problem in that room. It's part of it. In that room, somebody said something about the in the media, and he got some criticism. Pew got when you play for the New York Giants and you're not playing well, you're going to get criticized. That's just what it is. Mm -hmm. That's how it is. Every single player on the roster was criticized last year. Listen to Pew's interviews. He was tremendous. He was. And you watch that as a younger guy. When I came into the league, I would watch the older guy speak to the media, and I'm like, all right, man, that they was testing you with that question, but I see how you kind of play that off. Joseph, so, I appreciate the something. phone call. Yeah, thanks, Thank Joe. you. Joey from the Bronx. Uh, one other item, quickly, just to build off of uh, his offensive line question, I've been telling people that you could make a very strong case for offensive line coach Carmen Brasillo being the most valuable acquisition for the offensive line room. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, that's huge. It is. Yep. He has well, a lot of experience. Illuminor spoke very highly about him. Very highly of him. You know, and the I've disciple heard of Dante Sar Sarnecchia, yep. you know, with the Patriots, who was one of the greatest offensive line coaches that ever lived. Well, we got to put it to work, you know, and it's hard. And w only thing we could do right now is speculate, predict, guess, hypothesize about what's going to happen during the season. We don't really know who the starting five are going to be. We don't. We don't. And we don't know how they're going to perform or we don't know their health because last year you look at the Giants week one, the whole, not the whole thing, but... Your best player on offense goes down in, in Andrew Thomas, you know, the, the Pro Bowl on a field left goal. tackle. On a field goal. Very early in the first game. <sighs> you know, so it's like it was stuff like that, just like when you look at the Jets. The Jets, you know, they're projected to be competitive in their division. All of a sudden, four plays in the game, their quarterback goes down. Like, you can't predict none of these things. You know, you can't predict who's going to get hurt when they're going to get hurt. What you do know is somebody's going to get hurt at some time. Because that's football, you know, and, and it's it's sad to say out loud, and I hate saying it out loud, but it's the truth. Well, and the Giants have to be prepared for it. That's why you bring in solid backups. That's why you bring in a swing right tackle or a swing tackle that can play both sides. You have to prepare for one of your best players going down at any time of the year. Perhaps the best way to equate this is that we all know at some point in time we're going to get a flat tire. Yeah, but guess what? You can never predict when it's going to be at all. <laughs> Mm -mm. Who it's going to be, when, and how many tires you're going to lose. Because sometimes you might lose multiple tires. <laughs> I'm telling you. Better you, have man. a spare, though. <laughs> you exactly. better have a spare. And that's the only contingency plan you can have. That's have it. that donut or have a spare. Ready to go. But at mm -hmm. some point, you're going to get a flat tire. Absolutely. And I guarantee you, you will not expect when it happens. Right. It's never at a like a great time. Like that was a good time that this guy got hurt. Never. I don't never know. Never said that ever. I don't think I've ever heard a person actually exclaim, <laughs> Oh, that was a good time to get that flat. <laughs> Boy, I was really happy that it happened then. <laughs> Jeff from Maine, you're next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hello. Oh hey, afternoon, gentlemen. Good to so, talk uh, to you. 
I'm actually liking Minnesota the first game. You know, uh, I'm I'm like with John. You know, I hate to see Dallas the first game all the time. Yeah. You know, so that that should be uh, really fun. Um, I, I've actually got a follow up question uh, from from last week about uh, Drew Locke. Um, if I could, I I mentioned that I thought he was like an upgrade due mostly to durability. Uh, I actually agree with Jonathan that I think right now Tyrod Taylor is a better quarterback than him. Um, but my question is. Since he is kind of he's bigger and younger, uh, and we have great quarterback coaches, do you think he might eventually have a higher ceiling than Taylor? He can, I, I believe so. It, it all it all depends on what he does moving forward. Of course, you know Tyrod. If it wasn't for injuries, Tyrod Taylor, I think would be a starting quarterback somewhere in the NFL. You know, injuries set you back. You know, whether it's you know a play here and there or a game or a season, it happens to everyone. I love Tyrod, and I always speak highly of him. Not just he's a great quarterback, he's a great professional. Mm-hmm. How he handled coming in and out of the lineup, how he talked to the media, like he's a true pro. But Drew Locke, the upside is there, the potential is there, but it all depends on what happens. You know, if the guy's good enough to, you know, dethrone Daniel Jones from the quarterback of the New York Football Giants and play, I think that says a lot to who he is, you know, if he can do something like that. Because look, I don't see Andrew and, and Daniel Jones, I don't know who name I was about to say just now. I don't see Daniel Jones showing the little bit that we saw from him in 2023. I feel like that wasn't really who he is. You know, I think he was, it was sporadic. He, I don't think he threw the ball as well as we've seen in the past. I don't think he made that great decision. 2022 for me is what I remember from Daniel Jones. And if he can come back to that form and Drew Locke can beat that guy out, that says a lot about Drew Locke and the Giants will win some games because of that. You know, I don't know how it's going to work out. I, you know, my hat is in for Daniel Jones. I hope he's healthy because the Giants need great quarterback play to have success. And I'm not talking about winning a couple games, possibly, you know, being available late in the year and big. I'm talking about getting to the playoffs like they did in 2022 and winning one or two playoff games. Well, that's where the playmakers are now. They're in the passing game because of the targets he can throw to. There is no longer a franchise running back here. Right. It's now a running back by committee. So the big-time plays, the difference-making plays, will have to come from the quarterback quarterback. and his targets. They're going to have to now. That's just the way it is, the way the team has been built now. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm a big Daniel Jones fan. I think he's going to have a great year. But even under the best circumstances, the backup's going to have to come in and play probably a couple games, you know. Uh, Never can tell. Yeah, I'm just thinking maybe Locke could be good, you know, with the the quarterback uh, coaches that we have and stuff. And, and be at least functional, but maybe even win us some games. You know, uh, I think it's going to take a whole quarterback room, maybe even the third string too, a little bit. Let's not hope um, it gets to the third yeah. string. That's thank never you. good when you get to thank the third you, string quarterback. <laughs> Appreciate the phone call. I, uh, 201-939-4513. Quick before we go to Abdul, I know you're on the line. We'll get to you in 30 seconds. I talked to a longtime veteran offensive coordinator who has since retired. He saw Drew Locke's game last year against the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, I know our Seattle media person, when we were talking about the Washington Huskies, came on, and he did not like Jim, uh, Drew Locke at all and poo-pooed the game against the Eagles and said, oh, he had one good quarter in the fourth quarter. I talked to this longtime football guy. He's a lifer. And he said to me, I saw that game. There was a lot to work with. If I were an offensive coordinator in the league today, I would not mind having him in my quarterback room because I saw enough of tools there that would make me excited. I think I could win with him. I'm just offering that to you, and that's and that's I'm not going to name names, but that's from somebody who I have tremendous respect for. And if he felt that way, it's probably very likely that's one of the reasons why Brian Dable was was okay with signing him. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I don't know too much about him, Drew Locke. You know, but I will come to training camp. I will get my eyes on him. I mm-hmm. will see how he handles not only the media, but, you know, the pass rush early. I want to see all of these things. And, like, I, it's hard for me to make because I haven't watched too much film on the guy because he doesn't really have too much film out there. You know? Well, if you get a chance, go back into uh, the NFL Plus yeah. and watch last year's game against the Eagles and, and see what you think. Yeah, I will. Abdul from Minnesota. How about that? <laughs> Playing the Vikings opening doing? day. We got Abdul on the line here. Hello. I, I am so excited about that. I, I wish it was in Minnesota because, you know, I, I could go to the game. Did you <laughs> go to the playoff game? Were you, were you at the playoff I was, game? I was there, and I was so loud. 
Nice. <laughs> it was a beautiful, beautiful day. Love, love being, love being it's, there. It's a great day. The thing about Minnesota fans, they are so friendly. And <laughs> so it was, it was such. It was a pleasure. Like it was a, it was a friendly rivalry. I could so, do without that great. horn, though. I mean, come on. Oh yeah. The but horn you know is just uh, a big also, fat also, headache. They did the skull. They did do. The yeah. Skull. Oh, they yeah, sure skull. did. Skull. They sure did. Guys, so, guys, that's pretty cool. Guys. They have fake snow in the building too. Really? <laughs> I didn't know that. Yep. It blow it blows out during the horn. It's like fake snow. It's, it's oh, is that why I thought it was confetti? No, it's it's fake snow. It melts. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's oh really? That's I didn't even realize I didn't know that. that either. It, thank goodness yeah. it didn't get down to the field. That was on the sideline. It, but exactly. that horn could be heard, so, I think, three states away. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. Right, but that's their vibe. They're Vikings. So. I get yeah, it. Yeah. I get it. It's a, it's a cool, yeah. Boy, it was really but, quiet anyway, after so, the Giants beat him in a playoff game, though, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Very, yes. Very pleasantly so. Very pleasantly so. But anyway, I call for two reasons. Yeah. Uh, first reason is I really like the uh, New Jersey's in context of celebrating the 100th year, year anniversary. Mm-hmm. It makes complete sense. I dig it. That's it. Right. Anyway, so second of all, it's more of a, a broader topic. Um, Drew Locke was a first round draft pick, right? Remember second round. Thinking? He was a second. He was second a number round. two. Number okay. two. Right. Okay. Anyway, um, this is Michael and uh, is it Jonathan. Um, I'm forgetting. Is that your name? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, what? What do you? What do you think makes? What? What? What makes a person who has like like Jeff George? Who has all the talents in the world, but what what makes them a, them a bust? You know what I mean? Like, or what makes people who have less like uh, less talent become like? Okay, um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of all over the map here. But Jim Plunkett proved everyone wrong. Like he was a first round bust, then years later came back and won two Super Bowls. Yeah. Like what happened to Jim Plunk- Jim Plunkett? Well, look, from what I can speak to, from my experience being around, I think, three of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play football, Eli Manning, Tom Brady, and Drew Brees. When you were you, pretty lucky, weren't you? Yeah, I was. <laughs> when you look at these guys on paper and even the ability to throw the football, Tom Brady and Eli Manning, they're not too far apart. They're tall guys with big arms, you know, can look over, you know, not really athletic guys, but are really good in the pocket. Drew Brees... He doesn't fit that mold. He's like six foot. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have a strong arm. And he threw for like 5,000 yards, I don't know, five <laughs> times in his career. You know, he broke like every single passing record. The reason why, and this is me because I watched him do it, is number one, the preparation that he has, the ability to understand what he's doing before he goes out there and do it, but the ability to understand who he's going against and what's required for him to do. And then the ultimate measure is the ability to perform. That's the two measurements, the preparation, the ability to understand what you're actually doing, and then going out there and actually performing. Because there are guys that are book smart, and I say book smart, like classroom, they know everything. Oh, I will go here with the ball, and this, this. When I get this coverage, I will go here. But then you can be that, but you have to perform. And it's vice versa. Some guys aren't that book smart. They're not going to be like, oh, I need to go here, cover three, I need to do this, and blah, 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 blah. They're not doing all that, but then they go out there and perform. The whole thing to, I think, longevity in a career is having the preparation, the book smarts, and, you know, before you go out there, but then the ultimate measure is the ability to perform. That would it about, ultimately come down to. How about to. coaching? How about coaching? Like Jim All of that's involved. Kids. All of that's involved. I'm talking about specific players, right? right. Like Andy oh, Reid, oh. Andy Reid, and Mahomes. Mahomes wouldn't have been the Mahomes that we see without Andy Reid. Tom Brady wouldn't have been the player that he was for 20 years without Bill Belichick, just like uh, Drew Brees matching up with Sean Payton. It does matter, but at the end of the day, it matters the preparation of the individual player and the performance of the individual player, regardless of coach, regardless of situation, regardless of team. I think what he's saying basically is that there are mandatory starting points. Yes. And then other things that surround you and your environment can be factors, but you got to have a core list of things. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a great example. Jesse Palmer was all pro in (laughs) seven-on-seven, but his NFL (laughs) career was short-lived and didn't really amount to a whole lot. Yeah, got to perform. But, man, seven-on-seven, he was awesome. (laughs) 
there's so many um, examples of like you know Ryan Leaf, uh, uh, Jeff, Jeff George, uh, just all these players that had great physical skills at everything on paper, right? The height, you know, whatever. But just some, you know, something about them didn't didn't make it, you know. And uh, I've I've always found that really interesting. While you see like uh, people who don't have all the measurements come in and just crush. You know, and like and sure, I guess, yeah, I think I said Drew Brees. It's just a uh, a fascinating thing that I found uh, about sports in general. And so that, anyway, so anyway, guys, I appreciate you guys listening to me babble. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, you guys take care, man. Thank Thanks you. for the call. There, there's something. There's something to that, though. You know, like when I first walked into my first meeting, Drew Brees took over the meeting, and I was confused because I didn't know players ran meetings. <laughs> at all, you know, <laughs> and he ran a meeting, like telling us everybody what's going on, right. what Sean, he's calling Sean by his first name, like all this stuff was brand new to me, first day I got introduced to it. But then after the years go by and you start looking back at all of the success that you know that really good players have had in the league, it goes hand in hand with preparation and performance. It goes hand in hand and it doesn't matter. I was on Tampa, right? In Tampa, we weren't good. We won like two, like, I don't know, three games my first year. And by the time I got traded my second year, we won one game. Who was your quarterback then? Uh, it was Josh Freeman. Oh, wow. And uh, 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 what's his name? Um, the kid that played here a few years ago, the tall kid, uh, long neck. <laughs> they make fun of him. Oh, uh, Glennon. Glennon. Mike Glennon. Mike Glennon. I was going to say Gannon for some reason. Mike Glennon. Those are our two quarterbacks. Levante David has been an all-pro type of player since he's been in the league. Yes. And the defense has been up and down. The team has been up and down, but not his performances. Mm -hmm. Devontae David has been a great player since he came into Terrific. the NFL. Terrific. No matter how good the team was doing. Preparation and performance. Yeah. He was prepared for every single game. When I first of all, I'm a cocky guy, right? I think, you know, especially when it came to football, I felt like I was the best, one of the best will linebackers in the NFL. Then I got to Tampa. I said, okay, I'm not playing in front of that guy ever. <laughs> I watched him on film. Levante David was a different type of cat because not only did he perform, he was very smart, but when he went out there, he would do things on the field that I'd never done in my life. And there's something about them South Florida guys that play football all their life. Okay. They do things a little bit differently, like a Vilma, like a Levante David. Right. These guys are different, you know? And I will humbly say that. But at the end of the day, what made me good, because I prepared and I performed. What made Levante David good and probably a Hall of Fame career because he prepared, he was prepared, and then he performed regardless of what was going on around him, in front of him or behind him. Been a fun show, folks. Want to remind you, the Giants Huddle podcast with the initial reaction John Schmelk and I had gone through yesterday, a full almost 20 minutes, right, Pearson? detailing some of the strategies and some of the logistics involved in the Giants' 2024 schedule. Really, we didn't get into doing it much of that today outside of the opening game against Minnesota. But there's a lot of interesting quirks and little, little idiosyncrasies about the schedule that we got into. It's on the Giants Huddle podcast, or, or I believe, did we call it instant reaction, first reaction? Yeah, it's a video on Giants.com, and then the, it's on the Giants Huddle podcast as audio as and well. And is it also up on YouTube? Yep. Okay, so it's there as well. All your favorite podcast platforms. That's just the latest one of our long forms that goes up on the Giants Huddle where you get all those interviews with former players, coaches, and NFL people around the league. So that's there. Don't forget to go there. Uh, you can go through the Giants YouTube site. Season ticket memberships are available right now for the 2024 season. Why not get to see these uh, commemorative uniforms in person? Maybe they'll look even better when you see them up close and personal. And the Giants, well, if they win with those, man, you're going to love them. Again. Season ticket memberships are available at Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory uh, is right now uh, up uh, through the site. Also, Giants TV uh, on the apps. You can go through uh, Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Free T uh, Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app and get all the kind of stuff that you need. Remember, folks, Giants.com and the YouTube site. You got your schedule release video. You got all the details on the 100th season of Giants football. You got all the information on the commemorative historical throwback jerseys. OK, you, I mean, it's all there. It's all there. The stuff about hard knocks, which, by the way, we didn't talk oh, about didn't that talk at about all. That. Hard knocks out of season version First of time. hard knocks. Yeah. Very unique. All right. That's the third version now of hard knocks. There was training camp version. There was in season version. This is now off season, off -season. version. So much stuff 
on Giants.com and all of the Giants social media platforms. You know what? If you got half a day off, it's raining out, you don't know what to do with yourself, there's so much there to see. Yeah. If you if you love the football Giants, there's a lot of stuff you can take in and and enjoy the weekend. Go Knicks, go Rangers. For Jonathan Casillas, I'm Paul Tatino. This has been Big Blue Kickoff Live. We'll see you next time. It is presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York Giants. So long, everybody. 